I started to play Dungeons & Dragons not long after the release of the popular 5th edition. Hosting as a dungeon master made me realize that my collection of miniatures had quite a lot of holes. The search to expand my D&D mini collection brought me to the Dungeons & Dragons Adventure System board games. This series contains a handful of board games, each of which featuring quite a lot of unpainted miniatures, along with a few other components that a dungeon master could put to use in the Dungeons & Dragons role-playing game. These board games are a great source of unpainted miniatures, especially if you can find them on sale. Miniature Wargaming has made me an avid miniature painter, so the fact that these minis come unpainted does not deter me. In fact, there are perks to doing the painting yourself. In this video, I will give a review, from the perspective of a Dungeon Master, of the miniatures that come as components to the Dungeons & Dragons Castle Ravenloft board game. I will also discuss my results in painting these minis. Let us first get an overview of this set. The Castle Ravenloft board game is the first installment in the D&D adventure system of board games. The overall theme of the story setting and miniatures is gothic horror. In this game, players step into the shoes of a handful of heroes traversing the crypts of a castle belonging to an infamous vampire. I would say most of the miniatures included in this game fall into one of three categories. The first and largest category is undead. The second category is vermin and wildlife. The last major category is classic horror monsters. Let's get started by going over the hero miniatures. Five heroes will take the fight to the Vampire Strahd by exploring the dungeons of Castle Ravenloft. Cat, the human rogue, is one of the more dynamically posed miniatures that I have seen. She is posed ready to deftly launch a throwing knife or dart at an unsuspecting villain. My only criticism is that the model's center of mass is off-center from the base. This makes her more likely to fall backward, which can be annoying when playing on an uneven surface. I painted the model with a dark color scheme with the thought that a thief or assassin would want to blend into the shadows and not stand out in a crowd. Imaril the Eladrin Wizard makes for a decent arcane spellcaster model. He is depicted conjuring some sort of flame. This miniature was a welcome addition to my collection as I was previously lacking any spellcaster models with spell effects. This model could be used as a human or eladrin or elf depending on how you paint the ears. Alyssa the human ranger is one of my favorite ranger models. She is posed wielding two swords, which looks epic, and she is sporting an animal hide cape and armor that appears to have leafy camouflage layers on it. I painted her armor and clothing with a natural color scheme of browns and greens. I could see this model also being used for a druid character. Thorgrim the Dwarf Cleric is another one of my favorites. This is a versatile dwarf miniature. The game has him as a cleric, but I could see this model being used for most spellcaster classes. The model has some armor, but his billowing robes are much more visible. His hair is equally glorious. The design of his scepter reminds me of the geometric shapes of bismuth crystals. I tried to simulate that rainbow iridescence by carefully applying red and green washes over silver paint. I was somewhat successful, but I think I was missing a little sky blue in that color scheme. The last hero miniature is Arjan the Dragonborn Fighter. This is a cool player character model for someone looking to play as a dragonborn. 
Arjan bears a sort of layered or scaled armor and a crude two-handed axe. He is posed like he is winding up a punch. I can picture the character following through with that punch to knock someone out or launch a fireball. This depiction of a dragonborn has some sort of tubular hair-like stuff coming out of the back of its head. I imagine this to be an anatomical feature that provides thermoregulatory functions to a dragonborn that breathes fire. Painting miniatures gives one a surprising amount of control over the model's depiction. Your choices in colors can completely change details of a model. The blade of the axe has a slight texture to it. I painted it gray to simulate stone. If I had painted the axe blade brown, it would appear to be wood. I do wish that I painted the axe blade black to depict an obsidian material. We have gone over the hero miniatures. Now it is time to look at the enemy minis. These next miniatures did not fit into my major categories, but are useful additions to a D&D miniature collection. The gargoyles fit the gothic horror theme well. I can picture them perched on the castle walls ready to stalk the heroes as they enter the crypts. They are imposing when compared to the other medium-sized humanoid minis. Painting them is pretty simple, they are creatures of living stone. Just paint them gray, apply a dark wash, and then highlight the edges with a light gray dry brushing. These kobold skirmishers feel out of place with regards to the board game's theme, but they are very handy models for a dungeon master to have. I actually have a pre-painted version of this model. It is titled Kobold Soldier. These kobold models are posed twisting their torsos to look behind them. I do not mind having one kobold in this pose, but having a lot of them in this position looks weird on the tabletop. Regardless, it does capture the fearful nature of these small humanoid creatures. One detail that I like is the small cloth flags tied to their tails like to imagine that this could be a sign of rank or social status among the kobold society. One of the mini-boss models of the board game is Clack, the kobold sorcerer. I really like how the hood of the robe is draped around the head of the kobold. This model is the answer to the question, what if original trilogy Emperor Palpatine was a kobold? Kobolds come in many colors. I decided to give this magically gifted kobold red scales to make him stand out from the rest of my collection. I went for a dark blue robe and bronze armor. Next up we have some vermin and wildlife models. The first of these vermin and wildlife miniatures are these rat swarms. The rat swarm models are fun to paint and useful in a lot of adventures. I painted them a random mix of black, brown, and gray, and then carefully painted their ears, noses, and tails a peach color. These giant spiders are another useful and easy to paint model. They are posed ready to lunge. I tried to paint them with some variety, I used a different shade of brown on each spider. The bodies of these spiders are hairy, and I tried to emphasize this with a little bit of dry brushing. The game also comes with a few wolves. I am not a fan of this model, and I am even less of a fan of my paint job for them, but they are a common foe players may encounter in the wilderness. Now we move on to some classic horror monsters. These next models serve as boss battles in the Castle Ravenloft board game, and will probably look familiar to most people. Strahd is a vampire and the main antagonist of the board game's story. His model has a long flowing cloak or robe, 
and lots of heavy armor. The armor has plenty of little tiny details, some of which I painted gold. I gave him a pale undead complexion. I painted his robe a magenta red color and dry brushed a little bit of gray over parts of it to make it look faded or dusty. The werewolf miniature is posed in mid-stride. It is a decent lycanthrope model. The slender physique leads me to think this could be a female werewolf. This game even has a witch in the form of the Howling Hag miniature. The sunken features of the face successfully depict the hag as a decrepit being. I painted the model to have a pale, withered complexion, white and gray hair, and a drab brown dress. The last of the classic horror-themed miniatures is the Dungeons & Dragons version of Frankenstein's monster, the Flesh Golem. This is my favorite miniature out of the entire board game because of its detail, which is made more visible thanks to the monster's larger scale. The model is covered in stitchwork where limbs have been attached to create the body of the creature. Exposed metal implants are visible on the model's chest and head. Gruesome tears in the stitching and skin along with striations on the exposed muscle make this a truly hideous creature. I took extra care to paint this miniature and I am very pleased with the results. As a side tip, if you're painting this flesh golem miniature, use multiple different skin tones on the different segments of the model's body. It'll help sell the idea that this creature was built from many different corpses. I did this, but the effect is very subtle. The last group of models in this box are the undead. First up, we have some good old skeletons. I already have a few of these models, but I will gladly take more. These skeletons wield scimitars and large round shields. Judging by the shape of the shields, they were probably sculpted to be metal. I decided to paint them brown to give them a wooden appearance. If I were to paint them again though, I would have gone with the metallic appearance. I also went heavy on the black wash to make the skeletons look like they just rose from the muck of a flooded dungeon. These could also look really cool with some green patches on them to give the appearance of moss growing all over their bones. Most of these Dungeons & Dragons models are durable, but watch out with these skeletons. The feet are quite thin and prone to breaking. Zombies are yet another useful model to have. These zombies have a hunched pose that does not suggest to me a slow shambling corpse. Their stature makes me picture a primal humanoid making hobbled lunges and scrambling on all fours. Their clothing also has this texture that looks like a cheetah hide. Maybe they are caveman zombies? I ignored this pattern when I painted their clothes. I painted their skin gray and gave each a different combination of colors for the clothing, hair, and bracelets. The fingers of these zombies also look kind of long. Maybe this model is some sort of reprint of a creature that strangles people? This zombie model is quite unusual. If this model is a reprint and you know what its original purpose was, then please post a comment down below. Next up we have some ghoul miniatures. I prefer this sculpt over the ghoul model I previously had. As a dungeon master I like to introduce ghouls with a scene where one is carrying or feasting upon a corpse. This model really helps drive that cannibalistic trait home. The sculpt depicts the ghoul chewing on a dismembered arm. 
I also like the sunken eye sockets. They give the miniature a haunting appearance. One of the coolest, or should I say hottest, models in the undead category is the Blazing Skeleton. These models are made from a transparent blue plastic. You could somewhat tint the colors of the flames if you want to retain some transparency on that part of the model. I decided to paint the bones black like they have been charred. You have a lot of options when painting the flames. You could go for a natural yellow to orange and red gradient, possibly with a hint of blue where the flames are hottest. On the other hand, this is a magical flaming skeleton. Supernatural fire color schemes certainly are an option. I painted the flames a sickly green and yellow with a tiny bit of white around the bones. Purple, blood red, or maybe even icy blue flames would also look great on these skeletons. Painting allows you to tailor a model's appearance to fit a specific purpose. One intriguing idea I have for a Dungeons & Dragons encounter is a flaming skeleton that has been fully consumed by the color-sapping darkness of the Shadowfell. This creature would be wreathed in charcoal gray necrotic flames. I could make this idea a reality on the tabletop by simply painting a flaming skeleton model with a gray scale color scheme. The wraiths are the other transparent models in this board game. I prefer some of the newer wraith models, but these will do. I painted mine with a thinned down black paint so that they are still slightly transparent when held up to the light. I painted their eyes and mouths bright orange, taking inspiration from the D&D 4th edition art for a wraith. The zombie dragon is an unusual but fun miniature. The model looks like a classic large sized white dragon model, except it is covered in battle damage. This dragon has gashes and cuts from head to toe. The wings have holes in them, and the dragon's rib cage is mostly exposed. I would use it as a mini-boss battle for a group of adventurers that are going up against a powerful necromancer. The biggest model included in the Castle Ravenloft board game is Gravestorm the Dracolich. This is a huge blue dragon that has extended its life by becoming an undead lich. It is certainly a miniature suitable for a boss battle. Countless grooves and holes mark the outlines of the model's skeletal form. Some sections are more solid, suggesting that those areas have not completely rotted away to bone. Personally, I think the wings should be more skeletal or damaged, but the model is impressive as is. I decided to paint most of the model a cream color and then go over parts with a wash of blue and a wash of brown. My intention was to make it look like the remains of the blue hide and scales have shrunk to the skeletal frame. The wings are less decayed than other parts of the model, so I painted them with a more lively color scheme. I painted some blue over most of the wing bones and used an orange-yellow color for the skin of the wings. Heroes are going to have a bad day when this beast is placed on the tabletop. If you do plan on painting the miniatures of this board game, then make sure you take the following measures to get the strongest paint job. I recommend scrubbing the miniatures using a spare toothbrush, hot water, and soap to clean off any manufacturing residue. Apply a coat of primer to help your paint adhere to the model. Lastly, varnish the miniatures after you have finished painting them. A layer of varnish is armor for the paint. That is all the miniatures included in the Castle Ravenloft board game. You get a cast of classic horror villains, monsters, and a whole bunch of minions. Many of these models are staples of a Dungeon Master's arsenal. Skeletons, zombies, spiders, kobolds, and rats are all common foes for adventurers. 
The hero miniatures are cool, fun sculpts that each shine in their own way. You also get a bunch of other components, such as a stack of interlocking dungeon tiles that you could deploy in your Dungeons & Dragons games. I would love to drop a group of players into a subterranean maze and randomly draw these tiles as they explore. The Castle Ravenloft board game has a lot of value for a dungeon master, and if you happen to be a mini painter, then this box is a fun challenge. If you need to expand your Dungeons & Dragons miniature collection and do not mind unpainted miniatures, then this board game may just be what you are looking for. And that is going to end the video. If you enjoyed it, leave a like. If you did not, then tell me why. Comments are appreciated. If you want to see more content, then swipe that paintbrush across the subscribe button. Thank you for watching. Keep making and keep playing. Have a good one.